started out was with a partner of mine that I had known from undergrad. We bought two vending companies and um, merged them and ran them and tried to operate them to produce cash flow so we could go off and do other entrepreneurial things and not have to manage this business because it was supposed to be really simple. The first thing I will say is no business, even one as simple as vending machines, is simple. The next thing I would say is don't go do something that you're dispassionate about. Do something you're passionate about because your energy level for getting up and doing the hard stuff every day as well as the fun stuff will be much greater. If you're dispassionate about it or you end up hating it like I did the vending business, it's really hard to crank through that. And we had to crank through some very difficult times because then 2008 happened, Lehman Brothers goes bankrupt, the whole world turns upside down. All of our vending machines that are in places like car dealerships and manufacturing, uh, locations, all, all the revenue goes to crap. Excuse me, we're on video. So, uh, and so that was a real challenge. The thing, the, the, the real value add for my career though, was an MBA was great. And an MBA from WP Carey certainly was very helpful, but you never learn to make business decisions the way you learn to make them when it's your own money and you have to make payroll and you have to decide if you're gonna pull down a line of credit at 17% interest rate from American Express so you can buy products, so you can put the product in the machine the next day to hopefully make more money than you've just taken out in your own personal name that you've personally guaranteed and pay your employees so they can continue to drive the trucks and fill the machines. So capital allocation and resource decision-making becomes incredibly uh, acute in, in how you make those decisions when it's really your money on the line. Or now that I'm finding, you know, that I've helped raise money from people that I know very well, there's a lot of personal attachment to making sure that we're good stewards of that money. So that was a great experience from uh, not necessarily a technical standpoint, and it certainly wasn't a success financially, but I really learned some difficult things about how to run a business and how to hire people and what I really cared about and what was passionate about. And it certainly wasn't vending. Then I came back to ASU and ran an incubator for about four years at BioDesign, um, which was, was a really interesting uh, way to see a lot of early stage technologies and try and match those to early commercial opportunities and bring in companies that could help us think about, okay, now you've done this research and you've published this paper, how might all of that be really useful to an outside world user? How can we monetize that in some way? And so trying to build those partnerships uh, with academia and the commercial world was many times challenging, but also gave me a front row seat to how big companies see early stage uh, opportunities, early stage innovation, and what we at ASU could do to further that innovation so it didn't just have an academic purpose but had greater impact beyond, beyond the scope of campus, which you all know is, is a big thing for President Crow and certainly for Kyle here, the Dean as well. Then I got to go from there running an incubator to working for a real VC firm, which is here in town and the largest one um, in the Phoenix area, one of very few, called Greyhawk Capital. And this gave me a front row seat to seeing other people's ideas and what they thought uh, was innovation and how that innovation might be valued and how we might participate in funding that and all the mechanisms, both from an analysis, what we call due diligence standpoint on early stage ideas to um, the mechanics of how you make an investment and the paperwork involved and all the stuff that goes back and forth and what great lawyers in town to use and which lawyers not to use. And, and so all of those different pieces of placing an investment and being there for the negotiations was really exciting and incredibly valuable for me. Uh, and I got to go from there to an ASU spin out, notice the trend continuing or the theme continuing called zero mass water. The, the narrative I will tell you here is there's people in this room that you know well, and there's other people who aren't here tonight, but that you know well by virtue of having gone to ASU. And you can just tell about some people that they're gonna go on and do big things. And one of your professors, although I think he's not actively teaching right now, but Cody Friesen is a member of the material science uh, faculty, and he and I went to undergrad together back before this chart even starts. And I'd had the good fortune of staying in contact with Cody even through the years that he went back to MIT to get his PhD in his early days back here. And I did a little bit of consulting for his first startup um, 
that was called that is called fluidic energy and so he and I had just stayed in touch over the years and I'd been deliberate about that so the message here is find those people that you know are going to be stars in life in, in all aspects of your life not just your your career and find a way to continue to stay contact in contact with them and engaged with them so by the good fortune of having done that um, I could join zero mass water for a little over a year, uh, I was there or right around a year and got to do some really exciting stuff. If you don't know, Zero Mass Water is making panels that are kind of the size of one of these tables, uh, entirely solar paneled, and they extract humidity out of the air and turn it into drinking water. So I got to go to places like the Philippines and Indonesia and all over Mexico and a variety of really cool places in the United States to do installations of these as we were rolling out our beta product. Incredible technology, really smart people, very devoted. Uh, but for me, and this is a theme we'll, we'll go to on the next slide, the trade-off was not worth it because I was traveling so much and our youngest daughter had just been born and I was just away from home too much and it just wasn't gonna work out and not the direction I wanted to go with my career in the role I was in there. And so that's another message to convey to all of you is, is to have the bravery to say, this isn't what I wanna do and I'm gonna change my circumstances to find something that is what I wanna do. And now the PC is locked and I don't know what, how to unlock it. What's that? So, so, you know, I knew I was in a cool company working with really smart people, but I still wasn't happy, not because of all of those dynamics. And it's like, there's not a lot of great startups to work at in the Phoenix area, not like there would be in Boston or New York or San Francisco. Um, and so it's like, how could you leave this great startup that's well-funded, uh, led by a brilliant and very driven guy? And the end of the day was, I wasn't happy. It wasn't the direction I always wanted to go in life. And so I just jumped. And luckily when I jumped, uh, again, through a network and through ASU, uh, a woman named Sydney Peck, who was on the faculty, still is on the faculty, and very involved in entrepreneurship and innovation over at WP Carey, had just finished doing some consulting for a company called what was then Gamma Tile and is now GT Medical Technologies. And so I was fortunate to join them back in March. Um, and ever since then, we've been standing up the business and doing all the things that I knew we needed to do, having worked at the venture capital firm and other places throughout my career to say, okay, well, now we need to be a Delaware C Corp. Now we need to recruit a CEO. Now we need to recruit this kind of person. Now we need to ha access talent on a part-time basis for, um, all of our regulatory approval stuff. Who do I call for that? I'm active on LinkedIn. I find the right person. She's busy, but she recommends somebody else who's worked out really well. So another theme that, that I'm returning to is build your network, build your network, build your network, even now. So trade-offs, that's one of the things I just mentioned um, as it relates to my, my time at Zero Mass Water. What are the trade-offs? in your life, right? So for me, it's been location. It's been about staying in Phoenix for a whole bunch of reasons. And, and the trade-off there is, it's not as vibrant yet of an ecosystem for startups as there are in other places that you're all aware of. And so trying to craft a career and be in startups or be in that ecosystem has maybe um, not had the same traction here that it might have had, or not as opportunity rich as it would have been in other places, but I made a commitment to staying here. And so I've tried to, to um, find a path that allows me to do things that I'm both passionate about, <clears throat> that provide this trajectory to be in the startup ecosystem while staying in Phoenix. What are your work-life balance trade-offs? So for me, um, although I do a lot of work and sometimes I'm up late at night, I also try and shut it down at about 5.30 and not work again until 8.30 or 9 so that I can do family time and so I can be around to coach my oldest daughter's softball team on Tuesdays and Thursdays and stuff like that. So that's a trade-off that has meant I don't go do other things because that trade-off's important to me. That flows right into family commitments. And so my comment and the thing that I always remind myself about is you can't have it all. So a lot of times I'll complain <laughs> to people that are my mentors, oh, you know, if only Phoenix had more startup companies, I would have had more opportunity. And the reality is I haven't had that opportunity because I've decided I've made, I have made the conscious decision to stay here and try and build that ecosystem. And so I can't complain about the fact that I've made that decision and I'm not in San Francisco where there are more startup companies to work for, right? So that's a trade-off and just understand that trade-off and move forward. Uh, invest in figuring out what you want your career to be. That seems like a 
simple trite statement. You guys have a great career services organization here to help you do that. But I think that's a, a constant conversation to have with yourself. And the first bullet point and the second bullet point really go together, which is be deliberate. Right? Think about it. Sit down and make a list of what your trade-offs are. Sit down and think about where you want to be in five years, an arbitrary number, maybe it's three years. Develop that framework that says, this is how I'm going to make my trade-offs. Is money the most important thing for me in a job coming right out of school? Is it opportunity? Is it title? Is it the people that I get to work with? Is it the size of the company? Is it the industry? List all of those things out into a matrix. You're all, or almost all engineers. So, you know, if you're anything like me, you do a lot of things on Excel and it drives the rest of people in your life crazy because everything has to be on Excel, but be deliberate, make that framework, understand what your trade-offs are and use that as a measuring stick on a regular basis for this is where I'm at. Is it, how does that reflect on my matrix or my framework of where I want to be at? And if I'm thinking about going somewhere else or doing something else, and you can even apply this to internships, how does it match up against my framework? Uh, benchmark your progress and refresh it every two years. So keep going back to that and being deliberate about it because your circumstances will change, right? Maybe you've moved to a different city. Maybe you've decided to get married. Maybe you just got out of a relationship and it's a great time to go try something new in a completely different place. So be deliberate and, and refresh at least every two years. The third um, is again, seemingly trite, but when I was sitting in a room not like this, because we didn't have anything nearly this nice when I was in school here, and you know, it was up will, uphill both ways to school in the snow. But uh, think about your personal brand, right? And it's not just how you dress and how you act, but it's the, the way you speak, it's the things that you associate with. So um, trying to say this in a tactful way, I, a lot of my personal brand has been very closely associated with ASU. Both, uh, both in my career experience and my education, as well as having grown up here, you know, I used to beat the ASU drum more than anyone you probably ever met. I went to both Rose Bowls, the 87 Rose Bowl, the 97 Rose Bowl. I can quote you chapter and verse on the 96 football season that was perhaps the most amazing ever in ASU's history. Um, but that closeness of brand association certainly has good cachet in, in different parts of the world. Um, but doesn't necessarily translate as universally as I might have liked it to. And that's fine because I have chosen, and again, my screens are out, so I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, but, you know, think about that. And it's, it's also, it goes as far as, like now for work, professionally, all I do is wear purple or pink, because everybody remembers a tall guy in a purple, purple or pink shirt. And what did Steve Jobs do? Did you ever see him in a white shirt? Black turtleneck and jeans, right? So he had a very personal brand, a well-established personal brand. And you see this happening more and more often. The other thing that's interesting about that that I've read, and, and other folks have done this as well, is like if you, if you narrow the aperture on the decisions you have to make that are simple every day, it leaves more of your computing power for making decisions that are more complicated, right? So by having only pink and purple shirts, it makes it really easy to throw on a pair of jeans and a, and a shirt every day before I leave the house and I don't have to think about mixing and matching and I'm not that fashion conscious anyway. I leave that to my amazing wife who's far more fashionable than anyone else I've ever met. But then think about how you promote that brand, right? So um, don't get too hung up on um, the things that excite you because they excite you and associating with them. But think about how that then reflects uh, on your career and the people you surround yourself with. So, you know, God, I love playing video games and this is my favorite game and these are all my favorite characters. If you get too closely attached to something like that, and I'm just using this as an example, and it's probably a terrible example because I don't play video games, but nonetheless, um, don't let any one thing override your own personal brand and be very deliberate, even at the early stage you are all are at, on how you cultivate and curate that brand because that's going to go with you and you're going to be able to build that over the course of your career. So those are my main highlights and I've talked really fast and run through all of my slides and no one has asked any questions. So either you're all really busy on Instagram and Twitter or I wasn't very interesting, or I talked too fast and you didn't get to absorb any of it. So I'm done, please ask a question. Or you can just go have sandwiches and we can all be done. What does Brittany ask you to do? Can you use the microphone? 
Oh, yeah, please use the microphone. Here. Is it on now? Yes. Awesome. Okay. What did Brittany ask you to talk about that you decided to go through how you went through your career and how you got to various points? Uh, she didn't. She said, can you come next Thursday? Ah. And I said, yes. And I said, I don't have any time to present, to put a new presentation together. So I'm just going to present what I put together for some master's students at San Jose State about three months ago. We're engineering students. We can re respect not reinventing the wheel. So. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It was an efficiency factor. Huh. No, but I, I, you know, I, I hoped that some of the things uh, that I could communicate about my career were relevant to all of you since you're all ASU students. You mentioned that um, you worked in a startup and that's a lot different from like working in a big business that's already set up. Like what things did you learn in that business that you learned that you um, could have learned in a big business? Does that make sense? Yeah. So what did I learn by working in a startup that I wouldn't have learned working? Yeah. Okay. So excellent way to contrast the two. So like my day yesterday was... Um, I was sitting down at the Henry, which is a restaurant, coffee bar, whatever, at 44th and Camelback that a lot of power brokers go to. I was meeting someone there because we just closed a financing round and we need something called directors and officers insurance to protect them against liability if someone sues the company. So I was meeting someone to discuss different options for that. Right before she got there, I was doing an update to our website on Wix because I'm like the webmaster and the guy who's getting DNO insurance, and then I'm the guy who's setting up our Expensify account so that I can get everybody reimbursed, and then I'm the guy calling our venture capital firm to make sure that they got the financial statements that we sent over. So I think it's um, very often big organizations get uh, have the necessity of scale and therefore. Um, the the sphere of influence and responsibility is generally smaller but your ability to focus on just a few things and get those things done is much greater when you're in a startup environment typically it's everybody's wearing a lot of different hats and tomorrow is always going to be different than today was and so learning to adjust to the uncertainty of a startup environment i think is the most valuable thing you learn uh, by being part of a startup So you kind of breezed over your transitions from company to company. Um, and I feel like that can be, especially early on in your career, kind of like a scary jump to decide to leave and start somewhere new. Um, if it was scary for you, like how did you move past that? And if not, what sort of mindset did you adopt to kind of push through and decide to make that leap? That, that is a great question because I'm probably terribly unprepared to answer it, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Uh, so, so th one of the mantras of my life is transitions are always the hardest part of life. Whether it's a transition in your personal life, a transition in your career, whatever the case, like putting your, taking your child from staying home for three months with the family into daycare is a huge transition, right? It doesn't seem like it's that hard. It's a massive transition. It disrupts everyone's life. So absolutely changing changing jobs um, company to company is a big transition and i think to not answer your question directly and i will try to get to that but the first point i would make is the grass is not greener um, and be prepared for that and be prepared one of the things that you would notice if the the chart was still up or the graph was still up is a couple of my stops were very very short and that's because i left um, I left a situation because I didn't like the situation, not because I was really excited about what I was going into, right? So my first guidance would be in not making the missteps of nonlinearity is make sure you're really excited about what you're going into because it will never be as good as you expect it to be anyway. So if you're not excited about going into it in the first place, it's not going to get any better while you're there. And so I left AZTE because my boss had changed and I didn't like the new guy and 
so I was just like, well, you know, I don't need you guys if I'm going to be pigeonholed because I don't like this new guy. And I went to uh, I went to Bard and I walked into a really difficult situation for a whole bunch of reasons I won't bore you with. But in that transition, be prepared to be patient to see the good side, because at some point you'll swing to a good side, good side through the difficult transition. So now it's great that our daughter's in daycare now that she's been there for a year or whatever, because it gives us flexibility and she's learning a lot and all, she has you know peer interactions she wouldn't have if she stayed at home. So give yourself the patience to say, I'm, I'm not gonna make an analysis of this decision for the first six months. Um, because at that point in time, you will have met enough people and you will figure it, figure it out what the value is going to be by being there, what you can contribute, and what you're going to take away from that experience when you eventually leave. Um, you know, I, it's, it's funny. I've, I've actually never been scared to leave a job. Um, so I can't answer that part particularly well, in part probably because of my blind faith in whatever, whatever probably more ambition than skill that I have. Um, and in part because I think that if you do... If, you, if you're a smart person who's willing to work hard and has a good network, you will eventually land on your feet. So it was really scary to leave zero mass um, because I was in a good startup. I had a good salary. I had options, um, but I wasn't happy. And so the, knowing that I was sacrificing that happiness and that time with my family made the decision very easy and I was very much at peace with it. Now, if I had not found the opportunity I'm now in and it had taken six months or eight months um, I, I would say that the best way to make that transition is to make sure that you're in a financially secure enough situation that if it doesn't go well, you're not out on the street. Not that anyone necessarily would be that way in a literal manner, but make sure that you've got whatever, whatever it is that gives you that comfort for that six month transition period, make sure it's in place before you go. Make sure you've got buy-in from <clears throat> your significant other. Like, don't just go do this and not talk to your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your wife or your husband or whatever they are, um, if, the, if you have an element like that in your life. Um, so, so I think understanding that it's gonna be a transition and being thoughtful about preparing for it is probably the most important part. Excellent question, next. I'll run the microphone to you. Oh, there's one right there. Even better. Hello? Okay. So just as kind of like a follow-up question to that, I'm not sure if you explicitly said it or not, but did you have these like jobs or opportunities lined up after you decided to leave or was it just kind of like you just left and say, okay, I have to... S I think the only time... So when I left... Uh... When I left to figure out what I wanted to do in life and make lots of money in 2007 or six, whatever it was, I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I had, I knew I had enough financial runway to get, make it a few months till we bought a business or I started a business or whatever the case may be. But I, I also knew that if I wanted to do those things, and this is, this is comment for everyone who wants to start their own business, is um, if you really want to do that, put those resources in place so you can go do that and think about that full time, right? So even though we weren't successful in starting that business, buying those businesses, so on and so forth, um, if you don't devote like full bandwidth to figuring out how to move that forward, if you don't force the condition to do something and make it successful, then it's always gonna be more of a hobby or a lifestyle choice than actually a business, right? And so that would be my encouragement to people who really wanna be entrepreneurs is figure out a way to go all in. And so in that instance, I went all in and had to figure it out and we pulled the financing together and, and for a while it worked really well and then it didn't. Um, the other time that I left without you know, knowing what the roadmap exactly looked like was another situation where again, I knew I had a few months of financial runway um, and would figure something out and that was when I left zero mass. And at that point it was just, uh, I, I knew that I knew that the, there was an inflection point coming for the company, which was going to make it travel go up and all of those other commitments to the company go up. And I wanted to be fair to the company and say, look, I need to transition out. This doesn't work for me. I respect what you guys are doing, want, are doing and I want to leave on good terms. So rather than screw you and call you from Indonesia and say, I'm flying home and never coming into the office again, I want to set this up so you guys can hire the right people in and build that support structure for, for this scaling activity you have in front of you. And then, you know, I was just fortunate enough to 
to meet several people and have a few different options that kind of came my way and, and this one filtered to the top ultimately. Microphones everywhere. So you're for a few different startups. So uh, you also then had a few different venture capitalists that you worked more or less for. Uh, as a general, was what was the relationship like between venture capitalist and startup company? Was it like uh, on your back kind of thing, or what was that like? So I guess I have two perspectives on that because I actually got to work for a VC firm. Plus, I've worked for a couple of venture back startups. Um, First of all, I think that the, the general, um, the common sense that venture capitalists are sharks that are just out there to steal your company is a complete falsehood. And that uh, there, are, there are bad actors in any industry. So I won't, I won't say that there aren't folks that are like that and they're just out for the buck. Um, what I will say is that if, in most instances, uh, a really important input to production is capital. And so you can have a great idea and you can have total clarity on what the market opportunity is. And unless you either come from a lot of money or can effectively bootstrap something because you've saved enough of your own money or whatever the case may be, capital is generally gonna be important, right? So you're generally gonna have to get investors. Um, and then it's really about understanding, I think, I think where people get in trouble is they're naive both about the process and what they're getting into by taking investor money. And that's whether it's VC money or angels or whatever the case may be. Um, and, and we went through some of this uh, in my current situation. Uh, you know, you can't be a founder and think, I'm gonna take other people's money and spend it how I want to and not give them any information, right? I'm just gonna go, I'm a good person. I'm trying to treat patients with brain tumors. Don't ask me any questions. That's just doesn't happen, right? It's still, you still have a fiduciary responsibility. So I think the really important thing at the outset is to get very educated and align yourselves with people, align yourself with people who understand that process and understand what it's going to mean ultimately to have investors and, and what different um, clauses are as far as control provisions and um, uh, preference stacks for exits and things like that. So become, as long as you're educated and, you've, and you are educated going into that process and you have good advisors around you, then I don't think you run a very high risk of getting screwed. If you don't do that, then, um, then you set yourself up for a situation where you may sign a deal that uh, has elements of it that you didn't understand that ultimately are very costly uh, for a number of reasons. The second thing is, is um, just like anything else in life, when things are going well, everyone gets along. When things aren't going well, that's when it gets ugly, right? So investors uh, have to, they have a fiduciary responsibility to make the right investment decision because people have given them money to turn a dollar into $2. And so <clears throat> I don't think it's wrong in capitalism for them to want to make sure that they, if they're not going to turn that dollar into $2, that they try and get at least the dollar back. And so that's where the tension often arises when things aren't going well. Uh, I have, I can honestly say, uh, don't like that phrase, so I can very assertively say that I've seen just as many times when a venture capitalist, or certainly more times when a venture capitalist has been very useful to the growth of a company as compared to d destructive. So if you get the right VC firm, and here's another lesson to your question, which is not all VC firms are created equal. And so look for a VC firm that's well aligned with your industry that can, can make connections to other companies that might buy you in the future or partner with you on a distribution deal and VCs that, that know the industry well. And so they know the person who could be just the right VP of marketing for your company or just the right CTO for your company. Um, because firms that don't do that really aren't value adding and you really want to make sure you get value adding investors into your company, not just ones that are writing checks. Homework time. Anyone want to go to Noble Library? There's not even books at Noble Library anymore. I was shocked. There are so many open shelves. I was just like, it was like an Armageddon moment for me or something when I walked past it the other day. What do you do with a library when libraries aren't relevant for books anymore? It's amazing. 
There's a problem to solve. Dorms. So my question is, is what value do you see with uh, obtaining an MBA slash, do you recommend doing that or going through the startup realm? Or is there any disadvantages of doing that as well, learning the typical business kind of uh, teachings versus what you learn in a startup? If that makes sense as a question. Yeah, so uh, you know, I think largely the value of an MBA um, is, is not what it used to be for people who are going through corporate careers in particular, especially like, when you do the ROI calculation on leaving a good salary as an engineer, um, so that's foregone wages for two years, and then you know fifty to one hundred thousand dollars per year in uh, in what's it called when you have to pay to go to school tuition and fees. So so you look at that and you do the equation. And you're like, oh, I'm out three hundred thousand dollars. When you look at lost wages and costs of going to school, does that make sense? For me, it made sense because I knew I wanted to take a career pivot, and I knew I did not want to continue to work in materials and be an engineer. And I wanted to go more an entrepreneurial route. And I thought healthcare was going to be a big wave, and wanted to orient my career that direction. Um, and so, for all of those reasons, it made sense for me because it really helped with a career pivot. If you're just gonna, if you're trying to go from you know this level at Intel to this level at Intel, leaving Intel to do the, an MBA doesn't make any sense. It makes sense maybe to do an evening MBA because then Intel, Intel will pay for it and you continue to have a salary. Um, I, I think that particularly um, if you want functional understanding of business then I think that taking, even at your level, it would, is hard to do in an engineering curriculum because you have so many hours required anyway. But taking a finance class, taking an accounting class, and taking one marketing class would be incredibly useful because that gives you some context by which to learn as much about business while you're working for someone else's business as possible. If you don't sp speak accounting, it's hard to understand finance. If you don't understand finance, it's really hard to understand capital allocation. Um, and all of those things are ultimately important for running a business. Same thing with marketing, you know, what are the four Ps, those kinds of things. So I think these days um, you can do a really good job of learning while doing as long as you have a baseline context by which to understand all of those components. And secondly, to ans uh, another way to answer your question, Jared, is that um, it's the most important thing. Somebody, somebody I worked with at AZTE told me this once when I was giving them a hard time about knowing the answer to something. An entrepreneur doesn't need to know all of the answers. He or she needs to know the resources by which to go get those answers. And so again, going back to networking and having a resource of people whose expertise you can draw upon is really important to help plug some of those gaps that you may not have in business if you're on more on the technical side and vice versa if you're more on the business side and and not technical man that was a painfully long answer i apologize next no bull no bull so just kind of going off of the previous question um, I'm an engineer myself, but I have a big passion for entrepreneurship and business ownership, stuff like that. What prompted your pivot to out of engineering and into kind of a more business realm? <laughs> so this is going to sound like a flip answer, but it's absolutely the truth. My senior design project, I was uh, partnered with another guy who I'd known for a long time. And material science, I don't know how big it is now, but there was like 12 people in my graduating class. It was a really small program. It was 50 people, I think, overall when I was here. Um, so we were putting, I, I think it was a polyethylene. It was some sort of uh, uh, thin film cover for ICs. And we were putting it, we were testing different mechanical properties. And I was in the materials testing lab. What's that? Uh, integrated circuits, chips. So, um, so we have this this thin strip of very flimsy material, like saran wrap, but brittle. And we're putting it into a tensile loader, 
and I'm so bored with this project and I'd been up late studying for a test that I put the, tens the tensile test load cell into compression and like blew five, $15,000 of equipment like that. <laughs> I was like, I'm just not made to be an engineer. Like I, that, that moment was a crystallizing moment in my life um, because I didn't have the detail orientation to that technical um, activity or that technical responsibility. And so actually when I left school, I didn't go into an engineering role. I went into a product marketing role for an engineering company, a material science company that hired engineers to go into marketing and product development. Uh, and so that, that, was, that was a seminal moment. It was a culmination of other things that I'd done over the course of my undergrad to decide that eventually I wanted to go more the business route. It, so it's a blend of personality. It's a blend of skill sets. Uh, and then once I went back for my MBA, I really knew I'd found my groove. Great question. Noble. Does anyone even study at Noble anymore? So uh, what books did you find the most valuable for your career? Ooh. Uh, so Jim Collins, I think, is an excellent kind of business expert author. He wrote Good to Great and Built to Last. Uh, I read a long time ago, maybe even when I was an undergrad, I wrote Andy Grove's uh, Only the Paranoid Survive. That was a great book. Um, I, I love reading about business, although it's not necessarily helpful career-wise, that's written by uh, Michael Lewis. Just a fascinating way he writes a narrative about, he wrote um, what was called The Big Short about the whole mortgage crisis. Um, other really good business authors, the, I, th I found, this wasn't, again, necessarily this more broadly thinking about business. Um, two things are the annual report that uh, Warren Buffett puts out every year, Berkshire Hathaway puts out every year. And then I forget what the name of the book is. It's something like The Snowball. It's the biography of Warren Buffett. And it's all about the snowball rolling downhill, um, interest, the importance of interest accrual and stuff like that. So those are some good ones. Uh, there's uh, Clayton Christensen writes some really good stuff on earlier stage and, and crossing the chasm and things like that as far as early stage technology. He's a professor out of Harvard Business School, I think. Uh, those would be some ones right off the top of my head. I'm reading right now, I'm reading Think Fast and Slow. Is that what it's called? That's a fascinating book that's more, much more, um, on the side of human psychology of economics, but still um, is relational to economics in a lot of ways and decision making. And there's another one I'm reading right now. Oh, I'm reading a book about neuro, uh, written by a neurosurgeon that's fascinating, but that's only because of the industry I'm in now. Um, so that's a few samplings right there. But that's another thing. So tying that question to the previous two, uh, I would encourage asking those kinds of questions of people who you respect throughout your career and say, you know, what books did you love to read? Um, what books would you recommend that I read? So on and so forth, because that allows you to kind of get inside their head and learn things that they've learned from sources that they have found useful. And, you know, dog ear them and highlight them or whatever you do if you read it on a Kindle. I still am old school and actually read paper books. But, um, and use them as resources uh, so that you can go back to them on a frequent basis. The other great thing to ask people who you respect and who you can trust that you work with is what mistakes did you make? And not so much what you have done differently, but what mistakes did you make and what did you learn from those mistakes? Uh, one thing that, and I didn't do that well early on in my career, and so I probably re repeated a lot of mistakes that I would have learned a lot about had I asked that question of the people that I respected that I worked with. I got a good one for you. <clears throat> so since you've worked for a couple startups, I've actually worked for a startup myself. What kinds of things are you looking for in that company? Like your due diligence? to decide if you would rather, or if you actually do want to go to work for them. Because I think a lot of people in here are probably thinking of they're going to start their own company, mm -hmm. but they might meet somebody who wants to bring them into their, to a different startup, 
<clears throat> right? Which I think is kind of what you did, right? Yeah. So that's an amazing question because that's exactly the process I went through almost a year ago now. And, and um, so part of that goes back to what are your trade-offs for sure. And so everybody's trade-off matrix or framework looks a little bit different. So are you willing to travel? Um, are you willing to take a low salary and more equity? Are you willing to uh, not only be the, the marketing assistant, but also be the person who makes coffee in the morning and so on and so forth? <clears throat> um, but the, the more technical analysis, I think, it probably along the lines of the questions, along the line of your question, is you know what what's their funding position? So do they actually have runway to pay me in six months, or if they don't, what's their plan for financing so that they will have money to pay me in six months? Uh, is this is this product in this industry aligned with what I'm passionate about? So I'm incredibly unfortunate. I'm incredibly fortunate now to be in that role for sure. Does it give me the career growth? And this is true not just for startups, but any job. Does it give me career growth in the direction that I want to go? Um, do I have faith in the leadership of the company, not only to execute the business and the technology, but to do it in a way that aligns with my ethical and moral principles and framework? That's a big one. That one's hard to really understand. Uh, until you get on the inside and so be incredibly deliberate about your uh, research on that and I would not get hung up on have they won this competition and have they won that competition I think that they're um, I might want to take the mic off for this answer this part of the answer but I think there's a lot of emphasis on putting pushing student groups through competitions with too much of a focus becoming on winning student competitions and not actually building real value in the company. So don't get caught, whether you're in a company or you're starting a company, don't get caught on that treadmill where so much of your time is spent preparing for and winning competitions that you're not spending time on building real value for the company because the things you present in a competition or the things you do to win a competition don't necessarily ultimately build value for your company. Uh, so don't use they've won this competition and they've won that competition as a metric by which you should decide to go to a particular company. And then I think, um, I don't know an easy way to capture this, but look at who else is, again, it's a brand association. So look at who else is affiliated with the company. Do they have good outside advisors? Are they willing to listen to the advice of those outside advisors? What are those, do you have the opportunity to go talk to those outside advisors and, and, and understand what their view of the company is that maybe is a little less biased than the folks you would talk to who are working for the company? And the last piece is, say you wanna look at the cap table, ask them to look at the cap table. They may say no, who knows what a cap table is? Bueller, Bueller. Okay, a cap table is a capitalization table. So it shows everyone who owns shares in the company and how many shares they own. So you'll get a really good sense of um, how equity is shared and how it may be concentrated and things like that if you get to look at the cap table. And then that helps you understand how much you think your value is for being on the cap table, for getting options, those kinds of things. Uh oh, the microphone, the microphone. Hello. Uh, did you ever try to get your family to move to San Francisco or some of those environments that were more conducive of like startups or was there a reason why that didn't pan out? Well, uh, so when I, when I finished grad school, I looked at doing that cause I joined Bay Hill. Uh, and so this is where your personal life and your family life intersect. Uh, at the time I was married to someone who had just, she finished medical school the same week that I finished, uh, grad school. And so then she went into a residency here locally. And so she had to be here for three years. And then at the end of that three years, uh, shortly thereafter, we had our first child, the eight year old you saw here earlier. And then ultimately she and I got divorced. So then I wasn't gonna move away from my eight-year-old daughter and so on and so forth. And then I was fortunate enough to meet Brittany and now we have another beautiful, beautiful child as well. So, you know, th those were more um, circumstantial. Now when Kennedy, when Kennedy is 18 in 10 years and goes off to college, then we'll certainly revisit that conversation. But there's, there's also something to be said and, and 
I was a little bit blinded by this um, because of pride or whatever early on that like, oh, I went to ASU, I can do anything that anyone from Stanford went, uh, anyone who went to Stanford can do. And that's true, but you go back to brand value and I can tell you that, um, again, I should turn the mic off, that all else being equal, if the Stanford resume and the ASU resume are side by side, I think we all know the reality of, of the reaction to those two. So, um, you know, I was very committed and still am committed to building a stronger ecosystem here so that uh, regardless of where my kids end up going to college, that if they want to come back here, there's a stronger ecosystem in place for them to participate in and have a career in someday. And hopefully I can play a role in that. So I'm, that's kind of the that's kind of the flag I'm flying these days on why I'm sticking around and, and the impact I hope to have. Thank you. Sure. There was a for a short time before I ran the incubator, I worked at WP Carey as a fundraiser uh, for like six months. And uh, there was someone in administration at WP Carey, very high up in administration, no longer at the university, who said, the best thing we can do for our graduates is buy them a bus ticket out of town because of the limit, you know, this is a real estate town, this is a this town, this is a that town. Even when you look at the tech jobs that are here by and large, like Zenefits, which is mostly gone now anyway, but it's back office jobs. And so it is, I think there is something to be said that, f said for broadening your horizons, you can always come back, right? Here's the answer to your question. You can always come back. You can't always leave. And so if you find an opportunity that's the right opportunity and you want to go be adventuresome, know that you can always move back to Phoenix, but think about right out of school, what opportunities you might have more broadly beyond beyond the Arizona area. So you can bring that expertise back to Arizona and an opportunity here someday in the future. Because once you start having kids and buy a house, all of those obligations start to stack up and make it harder. To, uh, they make you more tethered geographically. Anybody else? Yeah, we have to get you a microphone. I'll get in trouble. Uh, you've already covered this, I think, but um, you just said, like, ask, like, what are your mistakes? So I just thought I would ask you that question. What were your basic mistakes and how did you overcome them? None. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of it is it, not a mistake. I think so. The mistake is for too long, I wanted it both ways. I wanted all of the kind of ecosystem opportunities of a different. Uh, metro area and I wanted to stay here and so I was I was a little too wrapped up in that I think to answer a question or related to a question that was asked over here earlier is I also didn't I wasn't patient enough with certain opportunities uh, and didn't stay long enough to learn as much as possible I think one of the things that I didn't have an appreciation for 10 years ago 15 years ago for sure was like it's not just about whether or not you love your job every day, because it's probably not the job you're going to do forever. Think about it like how much, <laughs> not just how much can I give to them, but how much can I extract from them, right? So how much can I learn from this job, even though it might be a crappy job that I don't like going to, but who can I, you know, who can I tie up with in order to learn from what that person's doing, because they're the, they're the kind of person that I would like to be in my career someday, and how can I learn all that I can, even if I'm only going to be here for 18 months, and extract that knowledge so I can take it on to my next endeavor. What I did way too many times was I was like, this job's boring. I can do this job in five hours and I have to be here for nine. I should have used that extra four hours to learn more so I could take additional knowledge from that opportunity knowing I wasn't going to be there long. And instead, you know, I, whatever, I, traded stocks on my Schwab account and read about ASU football way too much. So I would, I would say that my biggest mistake career-wise was not giving certain opportunities long enough to enrich my career to help move forward later on. And part of that is the arrogance of youth, at least it was for me at the time. And then now I'm just old and arrogant. So there you go. Next question. What is it, Thursday night? Thursday night Thursday night was always the big going out night when I was in school, which wasn't fair because the, you know, all of my, most of my roommates were business students, so they didn't have class on Friday. 
and you know I probably had Calc two on Friday or morning or something ridiculous like that. And then uh, Thursdays, we didn't go out on Fridays much, but we went out on Thursdays and Saturdays. So I'm keeping you all from doing that, and I apologize. Well, seeing none, thank you all very much. Good luck. Uh, I don't know if you know Brittany or not. She's not here any longer, but she certainly has my contact information. So does Brent. Um, I applaud you all for coming to something like this, and uh, good luck with the rest of your semester. Thanks very much. <laughs>